All right. So last class, we talked about chordata, right? The different, we're now going to start just one single phylum, and that phylum that we're going to be in is chordata. Um, what are the four characteristics that you have to have to be considered a chordate? Single hollow dorsal nerve cord. Jackson? Gill slips, good. Post anal tail and nodal cord. Good. So those are the four characteristics that you need to have in order to be considered a chordate. All right. Um, so we've got a bunch of different things that are going to meet those requirements. Those are going to be all sorts of different animals like fish and dolphins and whales. But then we also talked about two kinds of things that meet those requirements that are different from fish and dolphins and whales. Um, and those are two of the other subphylums in chordata. Those are subphylum urochordata and cephalochordata, right? We talked about those last time. Urochordata are things like sea squirts, cephalochordata, stuff like lancelets, right? Um, which of those? Which of those do not um, have the four chordate characteristics throughout their entire life? C squirts. C squirts, good. So C squirts only have the chordate characteristics during their larval stage. Once they get to their adult stage, um, then they don't have, they lose a couple of those characteristics. But lancelets have it throughout their entire life. Then we looked at the different, um, a bunch of different pictures and figured out like which ones were fish and which ones weren't. And we came up with our defini definition of fish, which we're going to be talking and talking about and using this um, unit. So they're aquatic vertebrates that are characterized by paired fin scales and gills. Okay. So this picture is just to kind of help you see um, the breakdown of this phylum. So we're, we're in phylum chordata. Okay. And we have two sets. Uh, two subphylums called cephalochordata and urochordata um, that we just very, very briefly talked about. And then we have subphylum vertebrata. Okay, vertebrata is where we're going to be spending the rest of like this quarter. Okay, so in this subphylum. So things that are included in this subphylum are going to be three classes of fish. Okay, agnatha, which are things like jawless fish. Okay, those are going to be like lampreys and hagfish. They're weird and slimy and kind of creepy, uh, but we'll talk about them. Chondrixes and osteixes. Chondrixes are things like sharks, rays, skates, and osteixes are bony fish like when you think of a fish, right? Tuna, okay, or uh, like a butterfly fish on a coral reef. Okay, those are the the different um, classes of fish. Then you've also got amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals that are found in vertebrata. We'll talk about all of these except for amphibians because there's no frogs in the ocean. All right, so that's what we're looking at. So, subphylum members, okay, fish and birds, amphibians and reptiles, okay, and mammals. So we'll talk about all of those except for amphibians. Okay. Vertebrates are placed into the subphylum because they have vertebra. Okay, vertebra are basically uh, segmented skeletal units that make up their backbone. Okay, you have a backbone, right? Okay, and your back is made out of vertebrae, which are separate individual um, bones. How many of you have ever had like a disc slip out or like had to get adjusted by a chiropractor or anything like that? Okay, so you know, like if something gets out of whack, then it can be painful, um, but you also know that your backbone is not just one solid bone, it's made out of pieces, right? Because it's made out of pieces, uh, that's good. It allows for flexibility for the animal. So if you can imagine like your spinal column being one solid bone, like you can turn your head or you can like bend over or anything like that. Okay, any of like this sort of motion, you couldn't do because your backbone would be one solid bone. So because it's got um, different pieces, you're able to have flexibility. One of the reasons why cheetahs can run so fast is because their uh, backbone is so flexible. That backbone also serves to protect that spinal cord. Okay, so the spinal cord will be protected by the vertebrae of the backbone. Um, that backbone will also provide a spot for a lot of muscle attachment. Okay, so muscles attach to your backbone. And that happens in your body to help keep you like upright, right? Standing up straight also happens in animals' bodies as well. All right, so you get lots of muscles that are attached to the backbone. 
Um, all of these guys, all of these vertebrates have cephalization. Okay, so they've got a head that has all of their sense organs in their brain. Okay, and then they've got a spinal cord attached to that brain. All right. Okay, so we said our definition of fish are aquatic vertebrates that are characterized by paired fins, scales, and gills. Today we're going to talk about the fins and the gills okay, of a fish. Um, so the fins of a fish. Well, first, oh, first of all, um, when we talk about fish, uh, the study of fish is called ichthyology. Okay, so ichthy means fish, ology is the study of. So this is ichthyology, study of fish. Um, the fins. So the fins of a fish are very important. They do a lot of different functions for the fish. Um, in fact, the fins of the fish have three major functions that they'll be serving. They'll either be stabilizing the fish, helping the fish to maneuver, or helping to power the fish. Okay, we'll get to that. Um, you are going to need to know the location of these fins. So the picture that you have in your notes, we're going to label that today. Um, you need to be able to label the picture of the fins and also give me the function of each of those fins. Okay, you will see that on your quiz, you will see that on your test, and you will see it on your final. So memorize it now, okay? Yeah, you need to know the location, so be able to like label the fins on the fish, and then know the function of them, okay? And the function, you we'll talk about it right now, but it's just gonna be one word. So hopefully it won't be that hard for you. Okay, so one of the functions that fins can serve um, is stability for the fish. There's two fins that serve to stabilize the fish. Um, that would be the dorsal and the anal fin. Uh, and that's one, the dorsal fin is located on the top, on the back of the fish. So the dorsal fin, uh, if you think of like a shark, right, and the iconic like shark fin slicing through the water, like coming to get you, uh, that fin that sticks out of the water, that's the dorsal fin. Okay, so the dorsal fin's on the back. Okay, um, and then the anal fin is on the ventral side next to what it sounds like, the anus. Okay, so it's got a top fin and a bottom fin, okay, and that stabilizes the fish. That means that the fish can't like roll over, okay? So it, it allows for when the fish is swimming for it not to be like just spinning in circles and not go anywhere, all right? So it stabilizes it. Yeah, the dorsal and the anal fin stabilizes it, okay? So they can go in a direction with a purpose because of these stabilizing fins. Um, a dorsal fin, so depending on the type of fish, you may only have one dorsal fin, you may have two dorsal fins, you may have three dorsal fins, it just depends, okay? Uh, we'll get to that. The next type of fin are the paired fins that are in the definition of fish. Okay, what do we mean by paired fins? Um, when we say paired fins, we mean there are two of each of them, one on either side of the body, okay? So there's two types of paired fins. Um, the pectoral and the pelvic fins, okay, and those are m used for maneuvering, okay? So they help to steer the fish. So the dorsal and the anal keep it like going, you know, upright and not like spinning, and then the pectoral and the pelvic fins allow for it to steer where it wants to go, all right? Um, so maneuvering, the pectoral fins are on the, each side of the fish up towards the head, so it's like their little arms up towards the head of the fish, and the pelvic fins are located on the ventral side closer to the back of the body. So imagine like little things coming out of your hips. Okay, that's what it, what it is for the fish. Um, and then the last fin is the caudal fin. Okay, that is the tail, essentially. That's the fin at the back that is used for powering the fish. Okay, so you've got the caudal fin to power the fish forward, the dorsal and the anal fin to stabilize it as it goes, and the pectoral and the pelvic fins to help it steer. The caudal's the tail. So here, let's look at a picture. All right, so here's a picture. So this top fin right here, that's the dorsal fin, okay? Yeah, and I'll scroll down so that you can see um, the one that's in your notes. Okay, here's the anal fin next to the anus. Caudal fin, the big tail at the back. Okay, and then you've got your pectoral fins and your pelvic fins. All right, so here's your, the one that you have in your notes. All right, so dorsal again at the top, caudal, anal, pelvic, and pectoral. Um, 
when you label this on your quiz and your test and your final uh, and tell me the functions of them, you can use one word to tell me the function, right? So you can say dorsal stability, anal stability, caudal power, pelvic maneuvering, so on and so forth. Okay? Make sense? Pectoral is for maneuvering. Yeah, so you'll see fish will like move kind of like airplane wings, like how they kind of move like this. Uh, and they'll move them to kind of steer where they want to go. Um, certain kinds of animals, yeah, so certain kinds of fish will like use different fins, can use different fins to power themselves. So like seahorses will use like their dorsal fin and you'll see like the dorsal fin like moving to power themselves. This is, in general, this is what we're going with. Pectoral is also maneuvering. Yeah, you'll see like we're doing stuff in general. If you look at different kinds of fish, different kinds of fish will do things not in the perfect way that we talk about because <laughs> there's lots of different kinds. So, okay, and then here's just another picture to help you see. So pelvic, pectoral, anal, caudal, and then the dorsal fit. All right. Here? Those are actually um, spines on the anal fin. So those will be spines to help like protect the fish, make it harder for predators to eat them. And the same with the dorsal fin. Okay, so those fins are used to help the fish swim and move around. Um, the primary method of locomotion for fish is swimming, right? Just keep swimming, yes. Um, so they swim. Some of them can fly. Flying fish can fly. They're going to use their, um, their pectoral fins to actually glide. They're not actually going to be flying, but they will glide through the air. Um, but fish are going to swim for a variety of reasons. They're going to swim to capture food. Okay, They're going to swim to get away from predators. They're going to swim to find a mate. Um, they're going to swim pretty much to do everything uh, that they need to do. Some fish actually have to keep swimming their entire lives because they have to swim in order to pass water over their gills for them to breathe. So they have to swim to breathe. Um, so, no, they won't sleep like in the traditional sense of like, I'm going to, you know, cozy up underneath this rock and sleep. Yeah, they don't do that. Um, do you know, uh, does anybody know a type of fish that has to keep swimming in order to? Certain kinds of sharks. The great white shark does, yes. Um, certain kinds of sharks, like nurse sharks and other such sorts of sharks, can actually rest on the bottom. But some kinds of sharks can. Does anybody know another kind? Mm -hmm. Bull shark, yeah. But like tuna, they don't have to keep swimming or they can't breathe, so they have to keep swimming. Um, how do fish actually swim and move and use these fins to move through the water? Um, well, they're actually going to use waves of contraction down alternating sides of their body. What does that mean? Um, copy that down and then we'll switch to the next slide where there's a picture and I can show you what that actually means. All right. Ready? Okay. Okay. So this is a picture of a fish without its skin on, or a drawing of a fish without its skin on. Okay, um, in a fish, the backbone runs down the middle of the fish. Okay, so it runs directly down the middle, um, and then the muscles attach to that backbone. Um, and the muscles are arranged in these like W-shaped um, packets, essentially. So fish have muscles arranged in these little packets. So they've got like a packet of muscle, like connective tissue, and then another packet of muscle, and then connective tissue, and then another packet of muscle. All right. Uh, how many of you have ever eaten fish and you kind of know how, like how it flakes off, right? What you're actually eating are the sections of of the muscle of the sh of the fish. Okay. So those sections are called myomeres. Okay. So the sections of muscle of a fish are called myomeres, and they are arranged like this, this W-shaped pattern down the length of the fish. Um, when a muscle contracts, 
does it get shorter or longer? Shorter. Okay. So my hands the fish. Okay. Guys, my hands the fish. You've got your muscle arranged on each side of the fish. You're going to send a wave of contraction down this side of the fish. Okay, and when those muscles contract, they get shorter, they pull on that flexible backbone, the fish is going to bend this way. Right? You're going to relax this side and then send a wave of contraction down this side. The fish is going to bend that way. And then you're going to relax, contract this way. So essentially what you get is this like S-shaped motion that you see in fish and how they swim. All right? And then they're going to use their fins to stabilize and maneuver and the caudal fin at the back will provide the thrust to push them through the water. Does that make sense? Okay. And this is just another picture to help you see it. And the, the darker areas represent the waves of contraction as they move down. Okay. Um, depending on the shape of the fish, uh, different amounts of the body will move. Okay. And like the body plan of the fish. If um, the fish is long, like an eel, okay, it's going to have that very, very pronounced S-shaped motion. Have any of you ever seen like an eel swim? Yeah. So it's got that very, very pronounced like big S-shaped motion because it's got a long, skinny, kind of snake-like body. Um, if you see other kinds of fish that are not quite so long, okay, you're going to see that mostly like their, their caudal fin and then part of their tail move to push them through the water. If you see like a little puffer fish, like the little box-like fish, really only the tail moves to push them through the water. So they've got like little tee -tee -tee, like little tail, okay? That pushes them through. Okay, so this is another picture to help you see that. We could go into the math of it all and physics, we're not. Okay, so talked about the fins of a fish. The other part of the definition, one of the other parts of the definition of fish is that they have gills. Um, their gills are used for breathing. Okay, so their gills are what they use to gather oxygen out of the water. Um, they are pretty much the same. For a fish, they are what lungs are to us. Okay, so um, they use their gills to get oxygen. Um, oxygen is dissolved in the water. Okay. Uh, oxygen can get dissolved in the water through a variety of methods. Um, if you have like ant, animals, plants that do photosynthesis, like phytoplankton, kelp, sea grasses, okay, anything that does photosynthesis is going to release oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis. And that oxygen will be dissolved in the water. Okay. And so that oxygen will be available to the fish. Also, where the surface of the water meets the atmosphere, okay, um, oxygen can diffuse from the atmosphere into the water, okay, and you can get oxygen that way. Also, where like you get waves and sort of turbulence in the water, that will create little bubbles in the water and can um, allow for oxygen to get dissolved in the water. How many of you have ever taken like a bottle of soda before you open it, right, and then like you crack the top and then what happens to it? Yeah. Like all of these bubbles start to form in it. Okay. All of the bubbles start to form in it. And basically what you had was gas that was dissolved in the water. Okay. And then when you release the pressure, all that gas comes out. Okay. So before you un undo the top, okay, you've got all of that gas dissolved in the water. You've got all sorts of gas that's dissolved in the water. Oxygen um, is like water in that it will move from areas uh, where there's a lot of oxygen to where there's not as much oxygen. Okay, um, So remember last semester when we talked about like osmosis and how water moves from where there's not a lot of salt to where there's more salt? Okay, um, And how it tries to reach equilibrium with equal amounts of salt and water? Uh, oxygen does the same thing. So if there's more oxygen here, less oxygen here, it's going to diffuse to where there's less oxygen to try and reach equilibrium. Okay. Keep that in mind. Um, we're going to talk about the structure of the gills, and then we're going to talk about how they actually extract oxygen from the water and why fish can breathe underwater and you can't. All right? Why, if you breathe in, it's called drowning, whereas they can actually breathe and survive. Okay? Okay. Um, 
So here's the structure of the gills. There's four major parts to the gills. Uh, you've got the gill arches, the gill rakers, the filaments, and lamellae. Okay? The gill arches are basically a bone okay, or a piece of cartilage that supports the gill. Okay? Uh, and that, see the green line that's on the screen? That's the gill arch. Okay? Um, the filaments, those are the blue lines. Those, are, those extend out from the gill arch. And on the filaments is where gas exchange will take place. Extending out of the front of the arch, you have these things called gill rakers. Okay, so these things stick forward, um, and they're bone or cartilage extensions of the gill arch, um, and they help to protect the gills. So the gills are actually open to the mouth of the fish. That's why if you look at a fish and you watch a fish swim around, it does that weird like thing where it like, right, like opens its mouth. Okay, what it's doing is letting water come in, go over its gills, and then the water exits out um, of their body. All right, so anything that comes in with that water could potentially go over the gills and, and damage the gills of the fish. So they've got these extensions that stick out that help to protect the gills from anything that might get in them. All right, make sense? Okay, on each of these filaments, you have these things that are called lamellae, okay, um, that help to increase the surface area of the fish's gills. Um, surface area is really, really important for fish gills because um, they want a big surface area so that they can do lots of gas exchange. So essentially, you have like you want lots and lots of surface area, okay, so that you can do lots of gas exchange. That's better than having just a little bit, okay. If you just have a little bit, not much gas exchange can take place. So the lamellae increase the surface area. So if you think of like a string, okay, think of like the string as being the filament, okay. Um, lamellae are little plate-like structures, here's my plates, okay, that are on that string that help to increase the surface area. So you've got a bunch of lamellae like all back to back like that, okay? Um, so if you compare the surface area of that to just one single string, okay, so you have a little string, you've got like this much surface area. If you take that, run that through the middle here, you now have that surface area and then all of this surface area and this one and this one and this one and this one and this one. So you've got a lot more surface area, right? So the lamellae help to increase the surface area of the fish's gills, which allows for gas exchange to take place. There's another picture to help you see it. Okay. Fish, Ostiac, these bony fish have four pairs of gills on either side of their head. Okay, so they've got four gill arches, right? So if you think like they've got like four on either side, okay? And then attached to each of those gill arches um, are going to be two rows of filaments. Okay, so you've got four gill arches and then two rows of filaments on either of these. So total, a fish will have eight gill arches, right? And then 16 rows of filaments. Yes? Okay. Um, and you can see, can you see on the picture, like the little bump? Those are the lamellae. Those represent the lamellae. And then here's like your little plate-like structure. Okay? All right. Countercurrent circulation. So this is why fish can breathe underwater and you can't. Okay? They have this thing that's called Counter current circulation. Okay, what that means is that the blood that's coming into the fish's gills is moving in the opposite direction as the water that's flowing over the gills. Okay, so they're going in opposite directions. That allows for them to get lots of oxygen and to survive underwater. Why, how, why does that matter? Um, Here's why. We're going to look at what happens when blood and water flow in the same direction and then compare that to when they move in opposite directions and hopefully you'll see why that helps them. All right? Ready? Okay. So this top one, okay, this top like blue line will represent the water flow uh, and this bottom kind of like purple pink line will represent the blood flow. Okay? So. Let's say that water is coming into the gills with 100% oxygen available okay, for the fish. And the blood is now coming into the gills. It's given up all its oxygen to the cells of the body. 
and it's coming in ready for oxygen, and let's say it has 0% oxygen. Remember, oxygen moves from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So is there a difference between the concentrations here? Yeah. So is oxygen going to diffuse into the blood to try and equalize that? Yes. Because there's more oxygen here, less oxygen here, the oxygen's going to move to try and change that difference, or equalize that difference, yes? Okay. As the water keeps moving through and the blood keeps moving through, let's say you're now at 80% oxygen in the water and 15% in the blood. Is there still a difference there? Yeah. So oxygen's going to move in, yes? Okay. How about, keep going, 60 and 30. Is there still a difference? Yeah, so oxygen's going to move in, right? How about 50-50? No. So at this point, you've reached equilibrium. You have 50% concentration in each. Diffusion stops happening. Okay, so if the blood and the water went in the same direction, you get about halfway through, and you're done. Okay, so the fish gets about 50% oxygen, 50% of the oxygen that's available, and that's all they get because they've reached equilibrium. Does that make sense? Here's what happens when they flow in opposite directions. So here's the water coming in, okay, again, the blue-green line, and then the blood coming in this way, okay? When the water comes in, it's got 100% oxygen, okay? The blood that is meeting this water that just came in uh, has gone through the gills, has picked up some oxygen, uh, but it's at, let's say, 90% oxygen. So you have 190%. Is there still a difference? Can diffusion still take place? Yeah, because there's still a difference, right? So more of it can diffuse in. Um, if you keep going and you go to the other end, okay, um, water that's leaving the gills will be at 5% oxygen. Water that's, or blood that's just coming in will be at zero. Is there still a difference? Yes. So can diffusion still take place? Yes. So because these flow in opposite directions, Diffusion can happen throughout the entire time that the blood and the water are in the gills, and the fish now gets 90% of the available oxygen rather than 50. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's called countercurrent circulation, um, and we actually see this kind of system or setup where things run in opposite directions a lot in biological systems. So you have this in your body as well. Um, dolphins and whales and stuff will use this to stay warm, okay? And we're actually going to be applying this concept, and you're, you'll hopefully see it in the data from your lab that you're going to do, okay? So you're actually going to do countercurrent circulation and see what your results are. All right? Does that make sense? One more thing, and then we'll be done. Oh, and because we get countercurrent circulation, fish can get enough oxygen to survive, and we have fish that live in the ocean. Yay for pretty fish, okay? A uh, picture to show you. So these are the lamellae, okay? Um, this shows you that the water flows this way, okay, and the blood flows this way through the gills. Another picture. Okay, so after the blood picks up all of this oxygen, um, it then needs to go and transport it to all of the cells of the fish's body so that it can be used for cellular respiration to power the cells of the fish and keep it alive. Uh, the way that it gets there is with a heart. Okay, so fish actually have a two-chambered heart that they will use to pump their blood throughout their body. Um, they have one atrium and one ventricle. How many chambers do you have in your heart? Four. Four, yes, two good. Atrium. Yes, you have two atria and two ventricles. Um, fish only have one atrium and one ventricle. So what happens is the atrium receives the blood, goes to the ventricle, the ventricle pumps the blood out to the gills, okay, the gills are where they pick up oxygen, get rid of carbon dioxide, and then from the gills, the blood goes out to the body of the fish and then comes back to the heart, okay? So, quite, I have pictures to show you. Okay, so this shows you a comparison between like a fish's heart and circulatory system and like our heart and circulatory system, okay? So you've got your two-chambered heart, okay? From there, it goes out to the gills, pick up oxygen, and then goes to the body and back. So you've got a one-loop circulatory system in fish, okay? 
in us, okay, we have one side of our heart that pumps blood out to the lungs to pick up oxygen, comes back to the heart, and then the other side of the heart pumps the blood out to the body. So you've got like a two-loop system in you and a one-loop system in fish. Okay? Um, and then this picture you have in your notes, right? So you've got your heart. Okay, it's going to pump blood out to the gills to get oxygen and then go out to the body, up to the brain, out to the organs of the body, and then back to the heart. All right? Do you like a little dance to remember that? Okay? <laughs> All right. And...